please, Robert Olds is going to take over now and uh, take it from there. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ewan. Of course, Ewan has spoke about that at the Bruges Group before, and he remains the only person in history of speaking to the Bruges Group to get a standing ovation, a sustained standing ovation for a long period of time. So thank you, Ewan. And of course, a copy of his Bruges Group booklet, which covers some of those points he mentioned he's at the back, and my colleague Graham will be able to get you a copy. Well, I'm going to talk about the UK trade after Brexit and look at some obstacles and opportunities. Now, why are we here? Why are we here today? Well, we're here to get arguments to win the referendum. And basically, we're going to be thrown, we're already suffering uh, the effects of some false arguments being thrown at us by the Remain camp, the people that want us to stay in the European Union and accept the governance of the European Union. Now, I've got some ideas, some big ideas, and just some smaller practical arguments that can be used to rebut the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that the Remain camp is using, uh, or trying to use, against us. Hopefully, it will be, will be counterproductive. Now, basically... We need some, I think, in the big, part of the big ideas, we need some pledges to win the referendum. And that, I think, involves uh, reframing the debate. It's not so much about leaving the European Union. We're going towards a better future, a global future. Perhaps one idea can be rejoining the European Free Trade Association. Britain set that up, or helped set that up in 1960. It's, it was, it's far more successful than the European Union. It has much less unemployment. It is, in effect, the most successful trade bloc in the world because the countries that are the EFTA are the richest nations on earth and most democratic as well. Now, we're going to be hit with the three million jobs myth. That doesn't go away. It is, of course, completely bogus. The easiest way to can counter it, I think, is to argue that we would remain in the single market for the short term. The single market has its faults. It's not perfect, but it has totemic importance, particularly for, for the city. But, of course, if we were in the single market whilst being outside of the European Union, the city would still be, have access to the EU's internal market, but it would actually be protected from the harmful EU regulatory agencies that have the power to shut down a British or any European Union financial institution, and we would be outside of the financial transaction tax. It would also reassure businesses that, for the short term, we'd be involved in policy shaping, we'd have access to EU working groups to help set some of the rules of the single market and really would allow for a speedy Brexit, so it would get us out of the European Union in the quickest way. Now, that I think to the big idea is that we remain in the European Free Trade, or rejoin the European Free Trade Association and remain in the European Economic Area for the time being, just as a temporary stopgap until we negotiate something better. That is not the end game, it's just a just a temporary holding station. Now, of course, what would happen if we do indeed vote to leave the European Union, but if we trust the government, they would issue an Article 50 notification saying that we want to leave the European Union. There would then be exit talks. Now, I think we should have those exit talks based on saying that we'll remain in the European Economic Area for just a number of years. We would get the EU support to keep third country trade links. I'll come on to that later. We would rejoin the European Free Trade Association. That would guarantee us that we'd still be a part of the European Economic Area. My colleague, uh, Hugo, the Baron Hugo van Randwijk, who of course has originally advocated these ideas, uh, has been over to EFTA. He's the Bruges Group Special Envoy to the European Free Trade Association, and they do actually want us to join. He, uh, Hugo has met with many people there. They do actually want us to rejoin, if it indeed it means that we would be remaining in the European Economic Area. This has a number of advantages. It would allow us to rebalance power in Europe. At the moment, too, there's too much domination of the European continent by the European Union. It's something that Britain has been opposed to since the time of Elizabeth I, Brit the European continent being dominated by one power. It's not been in the British national interests. And throughout history, we, this country has opposed it, whether that was the power of Spain, of uh, uh, of Louis XIV, of Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm I, or indeed even Hitler. We've always objected and fought against, politically or sometimes militarily, against Europe being dominated by one power. Of course, when the European, what became the European Union was originally formed in, in 1957, of course Britain tried to stop the continent being dominated by that, by helping to establish the European Free Trade Association, and for a time there was actually more members in EFTA 
than, of course, in the EEC. Now, unfortunately, Britain turned its back on that idea and thought, well, we'll embrace European integration, we'll embrace getting involved with other states on the continent, and we'll try and turn this centralisation to our advantage. We have failed in that project, so I think we should go back to the original principles of British foreign policy, which is to stop Europe being united. We do not want Europe being dominated by just one centralised power. It's not in our interest. It's not in the interest of other countries that are suffering as a result of these monolithic EU policies. It's not in the interests of people in Eastern Europe who are, who are suffering from the free movement of peoples and their countries being depopulated. It's not in the interests of countries such as Ukraine, who had a war largely over, as a result of EU expansion. This is something that we need to work to stop, and we can do that if we come out of the European Union and align with other countries, such as the Scandinavian states, and of course Switzerland as well, they are very successful in their negotiations with the European Union. And we can strengthen though, the hands of those who do not want their countries to be dominated by Brussels. Now Europe is of course much more than the European Union as we've heard from my colleague John Boyd earlier. We shouldn't refer to the European Union as Europe at all because the European Union is just one small group of countries within Europe. Now there's 28 members of the European Union but there's more than 45 countries actually in Europe. So it's just more than half of European countries are actually in the European Union. There's many different associations in Europe, ranging from uh, the Eurasian Customs Union, uh, there's the Council of Europe, there's the European Free Trade Association, there's the, European, the Central European Free Trade Agreement, and there's, the, there's various different structures that we can take part in. And of course the European Economic Area, which involves other countries outside the European Union. Now, of course, the richest and most successful countries in Europe, as I mentioned, are, of course, the EFTA states. We have Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Iceland. I know my flags. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but ba basically, it is important that, that we do have a holding station for, for Britain once we leave the European Union. Now, of course, we spoke... We, you skeptics speak a lot about free trade. Now, of course, free trade refers to not having tariffs, uh, customs duties when you trade. But really, the free trade itself is a myth. Of course, the, the tariffs are, as my colleague Ewan said, li little importance. In many areas, they don't apply. And they're only sort of high in certain areas, such as some agricultural produce and, of course, cars. But in other areas, they are, they are minimal. They're not even really worth as Ian Milne of Global Britain pointed out, the costs of applying the tariffs actually cost more than what is actually raised from them. They are re irrelevant, really, in the greater scheme of things, but there are other issues that affect trade and are actually detrimental to trade that beyond tariffs. And So really, if we focus too much on free trade, we miss the really important aspects in trade and we miss the opportunity to address some of the scare stories that the Europhiles, the Remain side, will throw at us. Now, the EU does indeed like to export its regulations, and they do want some compliance with, with their standards, which are increasingly becoming global standards, as we've heard earlier. Uh, the EU, when you trade with the European Union, there is always, unless you are part of the European Union, some requirement for bureaucratic compliance. If you're in a free trade association with the European Union, you will still need to prove rules of origin that the goods come from your country or been worked on to a degree in that country that has a free trade agreement. So there will be uh, forms to fill in. There would be an ATA carnet. You would need to possibly outlay on VAT. I'll come on to all that later, but there will always be some degree of bureaucratic compliance and you'll also need to show that you follow the European Union standards if you are exporting from outside of the European Union into the European Union. And that, there is no way that the European Union will cancel with these bureaucratic requirements. The only way to get around them is to, unfortunately, be a member of the European Union. But that, of course, has its other problems. But they're not so great. But we don't, do need to realise that these problems do exist. Because they will be used, these arguments will be used against us. Unless we have adequate arguments to use against them, the other side has the advantage. Now, of course, as I mentioned, the trade agreements with the European Union also require some degree of regulatory compliance. Usually trade agreements with the EU, even free trade agreements, will require that even human rights standards are 
respected, that, uh, that environmental standards will be respected, that international, uh, intellectual property will be respected, and of course they'll follow global standards. So there is always some degree of regulatory compliance with the European Union when trading from outside. And really, the, for the European Union, trade is increasingly becoming politics by other means. The, the institutions of the European Union, their main aim is not what a normal government would be to uh, make sure their citizens are secure and, of course, well off. Their main aim is to make sure that their standards are followed, that their ideologies imposed on other countries. That's why they include human rights standards in, increasingly in some of their trade agreements. That does not relate to trade, but the European Union wants to use it as a lever to gain influence around the world. They're not accountable to their citizens. The European Commission isn't elected. The European Parliament has very little, as John Boyd mentioned, very little sort of real relationship to actual normal people. So they don't actually mind standards that are actually damaging to people's livelihoods. They don't really care about that. What they want is their political agenda to be followed. Now, there are problems with trade. You, if, you're going to be tra if, if we leave the European Union, com companies exporting to the EU would need to go through a designated port of entry. Uh, there would be some tariffs. As you had mentioned, those tariffs are incredibly low. We would need to have our trade schedules readopted by the World Trade Organization. That's, that's something that we need to consider. I believe there was research by the democracy movement from the Swiss-based uh, International Center for World Trade Law that, uh, that covered this, and maybe that we can discuss that later. Uh, the rules of origin would need to be declared. I mentioned that earlier. There would be possi the possibility of anti-dumping action. Now, Professor Patrick Minford, uh, the author of The Cost of Europe, has done a lot of work on this, is that often the EU will threaten exporters from outside of the EU to the EU saying if you don't raise your prices we will impose a tax on you because we suspect you of selling your goods far too cheaply. We think you're trying to undercut us. They often take this action against China but it's, they did actually try to take it against Norway at one point. This is something they do use to increase the costs of exports so that therefore uh, homegrown or European U Union producers are protected from lower prices. We need to be aware of that. At the moment, being inside the EU, we wouldn't be subject to that. Uh, of course, the EU would not grant access to their services market or, in, or the market in public procurement for any organisation that is outside of the European Union. Of course, you had mentioned that really the services market hasn't really progressed great in a substantial way, that's certainly true, but there is still the opportunity for public procurement. And if you're inside the European Union or inside the European Economic Area, you have access to this market, which is worth, I believe, 16 trillion euros. It's a very substantial market, and if we're inside, then we have access to that. If we're outside, arguably, we wouldn't depend upon the agreement. We need to understand that the, these problems exist so that we can counter them. Now, trade is, of course, uh, we, when it comes to trading goods, we have a massive, uh, massive deficit. But, of course, when it comes to trading services, we have a surplus. So we do actually want to keep good trade links with the European Union to help our services industry, because it's the one area where we are doing particularly well, even with the European Union. Now, we've also heard, I've heard this numerous times, that if we left the EU the trade agreements that the EU has negotiated on behalf of its members would be void. I've heard that many times from the Remain side. That's actually can be quite easily countered, but we need to just, these are the problems that were going to be thrown at us. Uh, there, there's a conditionality of the, we're going to export to the European Union that we need to follow their standards. Of course, also, if you're exporting to the EU from outside, you'd have to outlay for VAT if you're a business. And, of course, if you're exporting to the European Union, there's a requirement for conformity assessment. You'd need to prove, or the importer would actually need to prove that the standards uh, of the EU are actually being followed. That's another bureaucratic problem. That, and basically, all these arguments, and probably some more that are made up, but these are the real ones, will be thrown at us in the referendum campaign. And we need to be able to, uh, 
counter these adequately, otherwise we're going to have a very difficult time in the referendum. Now, public opinion, just the British atti Social Attitude Survey 2005 has said that 69% feel it is quite or very important that people in Britain are free to get jobs in other European countries. So people do actually appreciate that. We know that there is the argument, the very strong argument against the free movement of labour, but we need to remember that some people in this country also value it. And of course there's also the belief that people actually support largely uh, policies such as the working time directive. The, the opposition to the working time directive has fallen quite substantially. British people actually on the whole do appreciate and do value the labour laws which are which we're told actually come from the European Union that guarantee rights for agency workers, that guarantee that we don't have to work too hard. Well, I know I'm working very hard on the campaign, and uh, as, as I'm sure we all are, so we're actually breaking that, but then we're, we're Eurosceptic, we don't mind. But basically we need to recognise that often we will, there will be, there is actually a very powerful left of centre argument, a sort of traditional socialist argument that can be used against the EU, as we heard from John Boyd earlier, but currently the other side are using arguments and they're saying that if you're talking about abolishing regulations, then, we're actually, then they will claim that we're abolishing the rights that workers enjoy that uh, guarantee them some protection. Of course, it's actually quite false because many of these rules actually originate from the International Labour Organization. They're just applied by the European Union. But we need to be cognitive of these arguments because if we're going to win the referendum, we need to win over those that are undecided, those who are in the middle. There are, there's around a third of the country, I'm just approximating, who are wedded to staying in the European Union no matter what. Around a, around a third who will definitely vote to leave the European Union. And then there's people in the middle. It's, I think there's some, what of a, a soft middle that could swing either way. At the moment, they're possibly edging towards us. Will they stay with us? That's the question. We need to have answers to these questions to make sure that they do. Now, answering the problems, the issue of the designated port of entry. Well, that's quite, that's quite an easy one because the WTO demands equality of access. If one country is given access by a port, it has to go through a, a, a customs post, then other countries should be allowed. But occasionally, you do get states that put rules against others, trying to make, give them unfair access make it harder for them, but really the WTO <coughs> demands equality of access via designated port of entries, so that should be fine. Tariffs, well, they're increasingly irrelevant, as Ewan mentioned. They're, in many areas they don't even apply and their overall weight is irrelevant. It, it doesn't even match the amount of uh, money the British government hands over to the European Union each year that they raise. Of course, one important point on tariffs is that the exporter doesn't actually pay. It's the importer. So if we're exporting to the European Union, we're not paying. It's those that are trying to bring the goods in. Uh, rules of origin. Well, actually, the rules of origin and the procedure that you follow when declaring that you're, if you have a free trade agreement, that your goods come from your own country, they're actually decided by the World Customs Union. And from 2017, the system will be simplified. There's, there was a report in Congress saying that it adds a lot to adds a lot to the cost of exporting to a country, having to fill out these bureaucratic forms. Uh, the late Ronald Stuart Brown was very good at highlighting the costs of rules of origin and saying that we needed to have an answer to that. Of course, uh, Ronald Stuart Brown was formerly the Trade Policy Research Centre. He passed away um, in 2015. <coughs> he was a great supporter of the Bruges Group and a very well-respected US skeptic. He's very worthwhile to remember him now uh, but from 2017 the system will be a lot easier so that shouldn't be a problem anymore uh, anti-dumping action well really western nations are not usually targeted by the european union it's only usually um, only usually countries such as china and of course we look at uh, the steel industry the british government has been saying to the eu you need to take anti-dumping action against the cheap imports of chinese steel and they haven't acted. So if any Europhile uses that argument against us that we could be subject to anti-dumping action, just say, well, 
They haven't protected our steel industry. Western European, Western nations are not usually targeted, and they didn't even take anti-dumping action when it was in the benefits of the British industry. So that's, a, that's another bogus argument. But we need to be aware that this can be thrown at us. Now, the EU will not grant access to the services market. You remember these are the problems that I discussed in an earlier, earlier slide. Well, Switzerland doesn't have access to the EU services market, yet they do very well. They have a very good financial services sector and business services. Of course, they get around the rules of being in uh, the European Union by having, having um, subsidiaries within the European Economic Area, which allows them to trade it. They find it slightly cumbersome, but it works fine for them. Or, of course, another way is that we remain in the European Economic Area, and then we have full access, just like any other any other uh, business in the European Union to both the services market and the public procurement market. But anyway, as you had mentioned, global markets are far more important to the UK in terms of services than the European Union. The European Union hasn't really got its house in order in any realistic <coughs> way when it comes to services. So basically, if we were outside of the European Union, another good argument is that we would be able to make our own trade agreements that would include uh, trade in services, whereas the European Union's trade agreements usually don't touch on that subject. So it would actually be overall far more beneficial if we were outside. That's uh, another argument we can use. Now the issue about void EU trade deals, I saw Hillary Benn uh, saying that on, on television recently, that if we left the European Union, the trade deals that, that the EU has signed on our behalf because basically, whilst we're in the European Union, we don't have our own trade policy. It's decided by some commissioner in Brussels who, well, not even I can name, and I, I study this. There's some faceless figure who's not accountable. But basically, actually, he's, Hillary Benn is completely wrong. There is presumption of continuance. We don't have to renegotiate from scratch the trade agreements that the EU has with Mexico or, or Singapore or South Korea, of course we'd inherit many if we actually rejoined the European Free Trade Association, but the simple argument is that they would continue. All that's needed is for the parties to just say, yes, they agree. And this is all under the, European, uh, the United Nations rules. If there's a treaty and a country secedes, and in these areas there's a presumption of continuance, the trade agreements will continue. So trade with the third party nations, some of which I mentioned, Chile is another, wouldn't stop because all that they would do is just recognise that yes, Britain was a part of these agreements when they were first negotiated. Okay, it's not in the European Union now, but we acknowledge, and they would say to the UN that it will continue, and that includes all the, hun the many hundreds of treaties that the European Union has relating to trade and flights. So it's quite straightforward. So if that argument is thrown at us, it is completely bogus. Uh, conditionality. Uh, now, conditionality of standards, it's, that's a very simple one to argue. We heard from the gentleman earlier that actually a lot of the EU standards relating to trade actually originate or increasingly originate from UN bodies, from, from organisations like the United Nations um, uh, Economic, Economic, Council Economic, for Commission, Europe. Co Economic Commission for Europe, UNIS, as I, as I refer to it, from the International Labour Organization for uh, uh, banking. Yeah, I'll come on to that later. The International Labour Organization for rules about employment law, uh, the Codex for uh, part of the World Health Organization for uh, food standards, uh, the World Forum for the Harmonization of Motor Vehicles for European car standards. We would follow these rules. We, we actually would continue with many of those policies once we're outside of the European Union. And so basically, when the Europhiles say, oh, if we left the European Union, because the European Union is our biggest, or the declining, uh, m declining market, it's still the biggest market that we, a single market that we export to, we still have to follow the rules of the European Union. Well, the rules of the European Union, when it comes to the export of goods, don't actually originate from the European Union. They come from the global UN bodies. That's where, that's where power is increasingly lying. And actually, if we were outside of the European Union, we would have more influence where it really matters at these global bodies that determined, determined trade rules. <coughs> of course, I've already mentioned the World Trade Organization. So that argument 
is again completely bogus. Uh, there would of course be a VAT outlay, but that can be reclaimed, so that's quite straightforward. Uh, there would be the problem of conformity assessment. You would still need to prove that you follow, uh, follow the standards of the EU, which of course is increasingly global. So you need to, the importer needs to prove that it follows the standards. That's something that we do need an agreement on. Of course, the easiest way is to, uh, is to, rem is to remain in the European economic area, and then there is a presumption. There is a, uh, the, uh, the mutual recognition of standards, so you wouldn't actually need to prove that you follow the standards because it's, there's mutual recognition. One, if one good can be sold, one product can be sold in one European economic area state, it can be sold in another. You don't need to confirm that it, that it is okay. Now, of course, thanks to uh, Hugo, we did a, the Bruce Group did an opinion poll. Uh, EFTA is a very popular alternative. We need a positive alternative, and EFTA is very good because the EFTA countries are far more democratic than European Union countries and far more better off. And according to our poll, 71% they'd rather Britain join EFTA uh, and you know, leave the European Union and join EFTA, and just 29% thought that we should remain in the European Union. If we advocate joining EFTA, we win the referendum, and that's what we want to do, and then we can take it from there, the rest of it. We can sort the rest out later, but the main thing is to get out of the European Union, and EFTA is a very popular alternative. And basically it's leaving the political union, but keeping economic links. Now EFTA membership allows for membership of the single market. Uh, you can actually restrict immigration using articles 112, 113 and protocol 15, of the EA agreement. Liechtenstein does it. Little Liechtenstein doesn't give the right of residency to, uh, to other, other peoples in the European Union, uh, whereas even Switzerland does. So if Liechtenstein can, can use the EEA to restrict immigration, then so can we. So and basically all the, a lot of what David Cameron is talking about and Donald Tusk about the emergency break, that's just a copy. The language is just copied from the EEA agreement. Uh, whereas actually, of course, David Cameron's emergency break can't actually work because whilst we're in the EU, we don't make the rules. But if we're outside, even if we're in the European economic area, the final judge, as it were, of whether you're following those rules is your national institutions. There is an EFTA court, but it doesn't have power like the ECJ does. Uh, of course, it guarantees trade and encourages investment, and you have the right to make your own trade agreements, which is what we want. And the majority of EEA relevant rules are determined above the EU by specialised UN agencies. Now, you don't have to note this down, but this is some, just some of the, uh, the system that Ewan referred to in his talk, where there was 96 different global bodies. These are the UN agencies, the International Labour Organization. Um, UNIS is, is along, along here as well. There's, this is where power increasingly lies. But Britain doesn't have a voice in these bodies because we're in the European Union. We're represented by some faceless commissioner who's not acting in the British interest because we only have around 12% say in EU policies. If we were outside, we'd have our own representative in these intergovernmental bodies that are, where policies are agreed uh, unanimously. Countries have a veto and they're not dictated to. If we're outside of the European Union, we'll be able to in, get involved with where power really matters. And when it comes to finance, the European Union is not the most relevant body. Uh, we would still have access to financial markets because we'd be following the OECD, the Basel, the G20, World Bank, uh, F Financial Stability Board rules. And basically, that's where power lies. But if we're in the European Union, we're not representing ourselves where it really, really matters. And some people might be concerned about European economic area rules. <coughs> Actually, they can't mainly cover technical regulations and standards and testing and things like that. Oh, pretty... It's, it's not, the, not really the meat and drink of the European Union, the main things we're fighting about is technical issues that just allow trade to function more smoothly. And the benefits of EFTA, well, it's, you're fully engaged with the UN standard setting agencies, you have formal input into the development of EU law, it's off the shelf, already an existent network of trade links that we can take advantage of if we joined, and we'd be outside of the things we really don't like, the European Union foreign policy, the European Defence Agency, the CAP, which we'll hear more about later, the Common Fisheries Policy, and we'll be free of the financial regulators and other EU agencies. We would be a self-governing nation, but just having access to the EU single market, and hopefully in time we would have a full trade agreement that 
we'd have, have even more sovereignty and more, more input and more control over our own affairs. Uh, but really, EFTA is a very useful stopgap. And the European Commission actually recognises that it's a convenient alternative. And that's some of the trade links. But really, leaving the European Union isn't the end. It's the end, you know, we, we can take a day off, I think, uh, after we win and, uh, and celebrate. But it's not going to be the end. It's just the beginning of realigning power in Europe, making sure Europe's not dominated by one block, such as Brussels, which has caused so much damage, ruined the lives of millions in southern Europe. It's about making our own country more democratic and ultimately we'd replace the EEA agreement uh, with a new international settlement between those countries that want out of the EU, those countries that aren't in the EU and of course uh, with, with the European Union itself. And we have a real opportunity to rebalance power and achieve the principles of British foreign policy which is to stop the continent being governed by the corrupt lot in Brussels. Thank you.